Software Engineering Year 11 course, Unit 3, Programming Mechatronics. So we're going to take a look at this third unit of the Year 11 course, and this is where most the new content coming into the course is, in this third unit of Mechatronics. And what we're talking about here is programming robotic based systems that are automated and can manage themselves. So there's a lot of new terminology in this chapter and a new concepts to understand in relation to this specific unit. Although it is talking about mechatronic systems, still a lot of coding fundamentals are involved. It's just that we're going beyond just the software and controlling mechanical parts. So let's get started and look at the first area of mechatronic hardware and software. And firstly, understanding that there are many specialized fields that use mechatronics, such as assembly lines, which are used uh, robots with robotics arms and components to assemble systems along a moving conveyor belt or focusing on the different section to put a system or a piece of product together. And then we also have mechatronics used in areas where work may be dangerous in toxic environments or extremely hot environments that are hard for humans to go into. And thus we can send a robotic system into those fields as well as areas where we need to be extremely intricate. And the robot can be very secure in managing and controlling the tasks when doing those tasks. So these are just some examples of specialized fields where mechatronics support humans and do jobs that are either repetitive dangerous or require a high uh, amount of precision in order to be completed for what we need done. The next area then is that of specific hardware requirements impacting on code development. So the first area is that of the microcontrollers and CPU relationship. We know what a CPU does, it's a central process unit, and obviously all instructions go through it. It's the brain of a system, it makes things happen, it turns data into information. The microcontroller though, adds the level of the mechanical components. It talks to those. So once the instructions are sent there, it tells a mechanical component, an actuator or an end infector, how to respond. And obviously they are working together within an automated system, okay, in mechatronics. We then also have the influence of instruction sets and opcodes. So essentially the commands that are sent in and then how does the system respond? Now, in relation to the instruction sets, it will tell a system how it can respond and relates to the code in how it should respond. But the opcodes actually specifically say, this is what you need to do. And it selects the appropriate opcode based on the different inputs you're getting. Remember, these are automated systems, so it is determining what to do in specific situations. And then finally, we have address and data registers where this data is being sent and stored during these decisions and during this processing. Another area then is now of the actual hardware being used with the mechatronics. And we have three categories here of sensors, actuators, and end effectors. Now, firstly is sensors. They are the collection devices or input devices that gather data from the environment for the mechatronic system to interpret. So we have sensors like motion sensors and light level sensors, which correspondingly represent um, sensing either movement in the case of a motion sensor or light level sensors establishing the amount of light in the environment. So they gather data for the system to interpret. And we have many other sensors as well. Okay, we have heat sensors as well, as well as um, sensors that pick up on just the environment too and changes in the environment like humidity and things like that. So they all collect data for the system to interpret. We then have actuators that turn energy into motion. So here we have an hydraulic actuator, which obviously can make uh, pressurized things happen with the system, as well as things such as step motors too, which obviously get the system moving. And then we have the parts of the system that are actually doing things, all right, and actually carrying out the operations that the instructions is saying based on the input it is getting from the motion sensors. And they are our end effectors. So we have things such as robotic grippers, which are like hands on the end of arms that can pick up items and move items around. But it can also be things such as drills on the end of these end effectors as well, as well as lasers for laser cutting too. So a variety of end effectors can be used in mechatronic and automated systems on assembly lines. Next is the use of data, okay? These systems need to constantly be reviewing the data they are getting from the environment and 
be self-regulating. So we're looking at two types of data here. We have diagnostic data for ensuring that the system is working well. And when diagnostic data is showing that we are heading towards an issue, does the system, which should be managing itself, know how to respond to bring it back into the kind of safe working order before a malfunction occurs? And then the other area of data relates to optimization, ensuring that the system is working at peak performance, giving outputs, potentially telling a, an outsider user, or once again, the system managing itself, what it needs to improve and work at its best level, whether it means more energy from my power source, okay, or based on the readings that it's uh, starting to overheat and temperature is too high, which might also relate to diagnostic in that area too. The system knows how to respond, but obviously data is key in that area. All right, then we have software to control interactions and dependencies. So the fact that we're using software to obviously measure data and then respond accordingly. So things such as motion constraints on how much an actual system can move, and then that goes in with degrees of freedom as well, in what angles can the actual components move. The combination of subsystems being used together within the system and the combinations of sensors all gathering data from the environment and remember providing that input to the system which ultimately influences its decision making process and then through the combinations of sensors it giving that data to the actual microcontroller who tells the actuators and end effectors how to respond. Okay and then we have the requirements of the system things such as power battery and materials at first because that's what the system needs to run okay it needs power sources it needs energy and it needs material components in order to carry out its task but then also potentially specialist requirements as well those things that support accessibility needs and could support people with disability so where the system might have specialized instructions in specific contexts all right, and then we can also represent these systems with what's known as wire diagrams. And these can be used to represent specific data requirements, showing how data relates to each other and its pathways through a system. And then power supply requirements as well, showing that how energy is managed within the system there. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the next part of designing control algorithms. What makes a control algorithm different to a regular algorithm? Well, that is the fact that once again, as said earlier, we're not just talking about the development of software. We're talking about an algorithm that also represents a software that is also controlling mechanical components, controlling mechanical components. All right. And that's what needs to be factored into these specialized algorithms. So Firstly, we're looking at developing, modifying, and applying these algorithms in their logic, knowing how to actually design these algorithms in this control context. The next area then is having open and closed control systems. So whether they are fixed and these systems uh, aren't taking any input or whether they will be influenced by exterior inputs and how patterns uh, are registered by the actual algorithm, they factor that in, how code is used and how applications can be used in different ways okay, in order to develop these algorithms. We then have the features of autonomous control, that meaning we are developing these mechatronic systems to be autonomous, to work on their own without potential human input. All right, that's what we want here. That's when we get the benefit out of mechatronic systems, when they can self-manage, read real world data, read their own data and respond accordingly and maintain themselves. That's how we try to enable features of autonomous control. And once again, that must be registered within the control algorithm, but it needs data sources to do that. So registering data from its internal sources and what's going on in its own diagnostic registering, as well as sensors from the external environment. The final area of this unit then is actually programming and building a mechatronic system, which is probably the most daunting part of this new topic. So first that we have the production of a system for real world problems, which might be linked to an assessment that you do. This could be in the context of just merely software control. So just focusing on software that could control a mechanical arm or a Lego based robot within your class, something like that. That could be what the assessment could be built around. But then also looking even more real world, things that relate to mechanical engineering and the development of automated machines. And then also electronics and mathematics. And remember mathematics is key. These CPUs and microcontrollers are responding to functions that are built on mathematical formulas. So it is extremely important that we have a 
understanding of mathematics and also why that's so important into getting in for a prerequisite for tertiary pathways in this area. Okay, we want to implement the algorithms we've developed. It. So we've have our control algorithms established. Now we've got to convert that algorithm into programming code. And if we have used that pseudocode as a basis, we then just pretty much have to turn our pseudocode into the programming language they were likely going to be using to code our mechatronic system. Programming code, once entered, we need to test it. And it can be tested in uh, two different ways here. We could have simulation where we're trying out different contexts and testing ourselves using mock data and changing uh, specific features and seeing how the system responds. But then also because it is a physical mechanical system, we have to build prototypes, working models, working physical models, and then trying out our code in those working models and seeing how the mechanical components respond to the actual instructions in our program and if that is happening correctly. And then hopefully once it starts working um, fine, we can then perfect our prototype into our final solution. Prototyping by its nature is also an iterative uh, type of approach to development, which means we trial it, we see the errors, we update, and then we trial it again. And that's kind of a cycle. And we can also use external parties that support prototyping too, who give their own feedback. But yeah, we are trialing, obtaining feedback, updating the system over and over again in a prototyping approach. We then have that closed loop control systems, testing that the actual systems we put in place in the closed loop context are working correctly. And once again, autonomously, and then we have integrating the actual hardware components, the three categories we've been talking about, the sensors to gather the data, the actuators to convert the energy into movement for the system, and then the end effect is actually doing things we want our robot to do, using a gripper to pick up an object, all right, and then actually moving around and then doing something else, drilling an object, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve with your actual task. We then have to look at how our control algorithm can be used to enhance performance. So we've tested our control algorithm. It makes our system work, which is good, but is it working at its optimum level? Because optimization is key. We've already mentioned it once already. So can we tweak our code to ensure that we enhance performance, not just in movement and how it actually does things, but also potentially to conserve power as well, because power is finite. And as you can see, that's kind of a key in this chapter as well. And then we've got to think about too, that while that our system is most likely automated, there still is likely going to be user interaction at some point, whether it is reading the diagnostics of the system or being able to manually input instructions, there still needs to be a user interface to access the system. And what is that going to look like? Is it a touch screen that we can put instructions in there or can it be connected to a physical computerized system and I have a whole interface to work with there? That's things we've got to think about in the designing of these systems. And then finally, unit tests for ensuring that the actual parts and components of the system are working as expected there. So I hope this video has in introduced you and hopefully eased your confidence a bit in the context of programming mechatronics. It is a very exciting unit to be added to this software engineering course. Essentially, this is where the world is going. Now that we've got things such as artificial intelligence and an improvement of this robotics technology, there's going to be a lot of growth in these areas. A lot of systems that are physical and manage themselves, you know, and do tasks that we've already highlighted that could either be dangerous or be highly repetitive or require intricacy that humans can't do as well as robots. And they will be great supports to us all. So it is a very exciting unit of work, but obviously a lot of new concepts to understand. But I hope this video has helped you in getting a base understanding of these new concepts and what the unit is actually about.